digital media and the internet are transforming the way young people socialize and play, but it's also changing the way they learn and participate civically. MacArthur believes this shift could positively transform teaching and learning in this country. When we think about education, we get a little bit stuck in the 19th century vision of something that happens in a single institution, in a single place at a particular time. So one of the shifts that's been incredibly important for us is to shift away from thinking about education and to shift towards learning. Because learning happens anywhere, anytime, which is what the kids are doing. In 2006, MacArthur launched its Digital Media and Learning Initiative to explore how new technologies change the way young people learn. MacArthur's goal is to build a base of evidence to inform a new system for educating America's youth and to help us reimagine learning. In traditional schools, we've thought about learning environments as the interaction between a teacher, a student, and curriculum, or the content that that student is supposed to be learning. And in the digital age, the learning environment is completely blown open. Because when you go online, or if you're in a game, or if you're in a social network, you could be interacting with thousands of people, many of whom are your peers. And so peers play a hugely important role in learning environments in the 21st century. MacArthur has made more than $60 million in grants to researchers and practitioners working at the intersection of digital media and learning. University of California researcher Mimi Ito's three-year study of young people's use of digital media forms the backbone of research in the field. Mimi Ito has just completed a seminal work called Hanging Out, Messing Around, Thinking Out. And this was a three-year study, an ethnographic study, of over 700 young people, 25 researchers involved in the project. It's at the core of how we think about learning environments now, how we design them, and it's at the core of how we think about constructing learning networks. And people like game designer and professor Katie Salen are helping us reimagine learning spaces. Salen's new school in New York City, Quest to Learn, is based on curriculum designed to engage students in their own learning. In the game world, there's this, there's this phrase that's called putting chocolate on top of broccoli. And so people talk about what we really need is the fun of games put on top of the content of schools. And Katie's blown that apart and said, no, that's really not what we need. We need to completely reconceptualize what teaching and learning looks like. And she's done that through reimagining teaching and learning from the perspective of game design, and is really leading at the forefront of really reimagining what kids' experiences ought to be when it comes to learning. MacArthur's support for digital media and learning is rooted in more than 25 years of grant making in support of public education. Our goal is that at the end of the day, this leads us to a new vision of learning, that's based on several core principles. The first principle is the shift from education to learning, the shift from consumption of information, again, is something that often happens in schools, to participation in production, which we think is the core form of learning that has to be at the center of 21st century learning. The shift from thinking about institutions to thinking about networks. So we know that this isn't just about the technology, that this is about learning and that kids are learning in ways that are self-directed, they're learning in ways that involve both peers and adults, and they're learning in ways that engage their passions and their interests, as well as enable them to develop skills and competencies that allow them both to participate in democratic society, that enable them to get jobs for the future, and most importantly, to be lifelong learners. Did you catch the part about the difference between education and learning, schooling and learning. Uh, how much of the schooling process is to time a population to be released into society and how much of it is actual learning? And if you think about that, you'll, you'll pick up on what she's talking about. A whole lot of what we do is to get everybody to the same point at the same time. And probably the point is that that time is gone now. That we're going to have to start altering the way we think about such things. And that uh, we need to focus on getting people prepared to fill those jobs. And a lot of those jobs we looked at were two-year education degrees that may be paying $45,000 as a startup salary. But the problem is that quite often when we get kids out of high school, they're not necessarily prepared for those because they've been 
had to take this subject and that subject or some subject over here that didn't apply to that two-year focus. And uh, Mr. Taylor may know more about that, but I think that falls more under the CTE things that you guys work with and what we've traditionally done in academic school. And uh, I say academic not because I believe that vocational things and CTE things aren't academic, but they've always been labeled separately, okay? That's going to have to change. Technology is going to force us to change that. It's already started. We've talked about uh, how I have about 200 students registered for homeschool now that take it upon themselves to train themselves or the parents have. So that's just going to grow and grow and grow. If we don't be proactive and get in somehow to address that and be a part of it, we're going to get left behind. Now, we can't get away from these needs. We absolutely have to have good teachers. That is a priority. And I'm, this just isn't my opinion. There's lots and lots and lots of evidence for that. And those teachers have to be innovative, and we have to be innovative when we plan and with the solutions we come up with. <clears throat> we have to not think like the people who try to control Galileo. Mm -hmm. We have to try to, to see different points of view. We have to have strong foundations. You can't you can't just run, you have to walk and crawl and all the rest of that cliche. We need to go from from schooling to learning and let that be our focus. The, the scariest part of all of this is that where are we going to agree upon what is necessary and what's not and how that applies socially? That's where the real question is at. And there's not an answer or a group of answers right now. But that's where the problem's going to boil down to. And we're going to have to focus on integrating different disciplines to solve problems. That's where that that's where the future is. And I could I could have took a different path to this and I could have shown you technologies. They have technologies where they integrate uh, computers into people who are paraplegic. I can't speak for nothing about There's a legion. <laughs> Yeah. who are paralyzed, and they can actually pick up things as good as I can. You have to think if they can do that the one way, it can work in reverse too. They can make you control you eventually. That's where we're heading. There's all kind of negative possibilities with the, the future. I saw one video where a guy had uh, scanners on his hand and a video projector on his chest. He walked in a supermarket, scanned a product, it projected onto the the wall, what the product was, where it was made, how much it cost, everything you want to know about nutritional value. You go to another one, scan in. That's that's what technology's with us. The kids in our classes are using things like that. Not all of them, only the ones who have the money or the prestige or whatever that they have. Which I, this is my final point. Our biggest problem to address curriculum wise is the gap. The gap between those who are going to be able to be self-directed and learn on their own and those who are going to have to be motivated, cared for, encouraged. That's where your focus is going to be in the next 10 years. Thank you for letting me talk. I'll, next time I talk, I'll try to talk better. I'm sorry. I've got a question for you. Okay. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking the next much time about this other stuff. And I'm wondering what you think the value would be when you design a school, a high school, about room sizes and shapes, which I think rectangular, you got more surface area, which is the best one. You've got to get away from these round buildings. Uh, and we are have a lot of school buildings that are departmentalized. I'm just sitting here thinking about if I was teaching biology, how good it would be to be in close proximity to an agriculture teacher who taught animal husbandry and forestry, plants and animals, and you have them working together more than they do now. It's almost a taboo for some teachers to cross over to certain areas and do the more hands-on. I believe that you're going to learn a lot more hands-on I, you get so much instruction, then you do the hands-on, work with other people who have an expertise in that area. And then 
you team teach a lot of that sort of stuff. But in designing your building, you need to have it close together. Uh, Jerry, and, and not just, uh, and man, I want me to answer that, but not just uh, CTE and science. Oh, I'll give you that. I know that, that. but I think, <clears throat> I think more on the lines of a science lab and a math lab being one and the same. And you know, I'm going to tell you uh, something else. What Kenny Lou teaches. Yeah, I agree. With math, science, and physics. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying. That's the, my whole uh, point. Theoretically, Mr. McMahon, you're, you're right on target. It's, it is the way to teach. The, there's, the problem is uh, the teachers are one of the most... Uh, because of the nature of getting to become a teacher, what you have to go through, everyone thinks my way is the best way. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to get people who can work together harmoniously for long periods of time, especially in subject areas you listed. Uh, one of the things when you have academic excellence, if you ever watch the Big Bang Theory <laughs> on TV, <laughs> is that you get big egos too. Uh, if you can overcome that, then you have a perfect solution. Do you have a thought on what might be a methodology to use to be able to overcome that? Personality screens? When you hire them? <laughs> what about, team, what about professional development, team building activities? I do, but I also think things like that are coming as we get younger teachers. A lot of people do it best. Because STEM. of STEM. Yeah. STEM, CTE. And what we call academics, which I'm like you, it's all academics. A lot of younger people are doing it better. Uh, you may be pleasantly surprised if you see some of our, our younger teachers at work. Okay, now uh, going back to the question about the, well this is facilities planning. So when we plan our facilities, we might need to consider a lot of those types of things. Well, if you're, if you're going to be able to build a new building, there's no doubt that you should try to put the sciences and the mathematics and the peripheral CTE associated things there. I toured the University of Tennessee two weeks ago on Monday. I went down there and I went to the agriculture campus and I met with an environmental uh, engineer, professor, the dean of the college of environmental engineering, and all those things were there. And they were making things like uh, one of the things they had constructed in the ag mechanic shop had big, looks like jet tubes that you see on the space shuttle. They weren't that large, but they were about a foot in diameter at the bottom. It was built from weeding. It used propane gas. They drove it over the crops and it shot a flame everywhere except where the crop was at. Okay, well they had math equations like this written up on the board where they had calculated that out to draw it up. The curriculum to get to the point to where you can do that, you're taking physics, statistics, calculus, one and two, before you ever got to the point where you went into the ag shop to build something like that. You had to have all that behind you. You had to be fourth year or fifth year undergraduate to get to go into that place. So yeah, I think all those things are integrated on that part of the campus. They did take some of the basic <coughs> math, like statistics, on the regular part of the campus. But I think that that's what you're looking for if you get to build a new building. Yeah. And it would need to incorporate that. I mean, that's that's where the future's at. There's, the future will ignore these stereotypes you know, one that way. have been placed on traditional. I, I'm a math person. I don't write English papers. Period. That's not going to be. You're going to have to be able to write not only write the paper, but you're going to have to be able to present it, just like I did right. here. If if I can work a math problem this long, I've got to be able to tell you how I did it. And oh, I had one teacher over at ETSU, calculus. I had dropped his class. Couldn't understand what he said. But anyway. If we're fortunate enough to be able to build new structures, one of the things I would like to see is we would have buildings that if you were in a traditional high school, you would recognize it. And we could do it probably in some ways cheaper than the current situation. Do you agree with that? 
type of philosophy? Jerry, I, th I think it goes back to part of that video, and then I'll hush because Phil's going to do his stuff. Yeah, that's right. But I think it goes back to infrastructure. Yeah. And I say infrastructure, I think, if you know, putting a blank piece of conduit that connects every room. In the future, if you have a future need, you slide a piece of Ethernet wire through there, and you hook every classroom. Talk about a math and a science classroom. You know, you, you wouldn't necessarily want to build a room that will hold 60 or 70 kids when for the most part you're going to have 25 or 30 in there. But if you've got down the hall, if you've got that connected via ITV or whatever it may be, you can still share that content yes. electronically. So I think it goes back to infrastructure. You know, you know hey, Chris knows about that sewer and some of those things. It's just flat out infrastructure, but I'm saying wiring. That's what I was thinking, you know, stuff like that. And I just want to put that out for thought. I'm sorry. Does anyone else have any questions? Philip, have you got time to finish yours? No, I'm back. You got it, brother. All right. Well, what I put together here is just a uh, quick uh, information on the, the year our buildings were built and the uh, acreage we have in this place and things of that nature just to kind of familiarize each of you with uh, the age of our schools and our facilities. And uh, all right, we'll, we'll just start. I did it alphabetically. Uh, Central Elementary was built in 1961. It had uh, some classroom additions in '79 and '99, and it sits on 14 acres. Now, currently, it has 269 students, and I use this year's uh, student count. Uh, it changes every year, but just for this uh, purpose, I use this year's. Uh, and the, and actually, the school's in good condition. Now, when I say good condition. Uh, some people may walk up to a building and say, you know, it needs painting or this brick is cracked. But when I look at the building, I look at the, you know, the infrastructure of the building, the, the heating system, HVAC, just the building as a whole. And that building is actually in good condition. And needs, uh, I could probably do a three-page thing on each one of these schools for me. But I tried to stick with just the, you know, just the worst or the you know, basic couple of the worst needs that be each school. And this particular one. I've got window renovations, toilet and dressing area renovations, in addition to uh, elimination portables. Now, the majority of our schools have got portables, and portables are a maintenance nightmare. I mean, to think we probably spend as much on a portable classroom as we do on, uh, I'm wrong, I don't have any figures on it, but I'd say 10 classrooms in a building as far as the maintenance. I mean, you're continuing to replace the floors, roofs, or just wooden structures. Uh, you know, they're out in the elements, you've got four sides versus, you know, a room that's in a building with three sides that's inside and one exterior wall. So, so basically portables are just a, just a maintenance problem all the time. Philip, you have the number of students that are currently enrolled there? Uh, yes. Uh, Do you have, can, or can you obtain the information on the capacity of that school currently? Um, I can't. I'll just have to physically go and look and well, see. When you get that done, would you do that before you send it to me? Uh, yes, sir. Because what I need to do, what that will do, that'll tell us how much room we have in each one of those schools for students. Okay. I think that'd be very important information. Okay. <laughs> Can you answer a question for me? Yes. How many portable classrooms do we have in the Carl County School System? Um, well, I was thinking 54. Uh, how many? It's 50. It's 50 plus? Uh, yes. Okay. 54 or 55 is a rough. We got we got a few a couple years ago, and I don't know what those are at. It's, it's, it's in 50s. Okay. It's low 50s. Mm -hmm. Are there any portables at Central? There are two. Would you stick that on how many portables at each school also? Uh, I can do that. Does, Does every school have portables? Not every school, probably 90%. 95%. I think all of two. Yeah, it's too much. All of two, probably And this, this, uh, this school here has probably is one of the top as far as how much land is available around the schools that is not in use. And I put on this school has land for future expansion. And also, <coughs> since it was in close proximity to a couple of schools right next to it, it's actually 4.2 miles from range, 8.3 miles from Kingburg, and 1.5 miles from Happy Valley. Over so that was just to give you a proximity as far as where it is in relation to some other schools. Now, for the benefit of those who are not real familiar with our schools, I tried to get an aerial view 
of each one of our schools just to give you a, an idea of how the grounds are laid out. And uh, this is this is the school here. Of course, this is the this property back here also belongs to the Carter County School System. So you can see there's quite a bit of area behind that school. That, uh, do you know how many acres is back there for expansion? <coughs> Actually, that's I don't know how many is available for expansion, but I think it's uh, 14 acres all total. I don't okay. know how much. But there's several several acres there that could be expanded. Well, just looking at that picture, it looks like there's probably half. Of four okay. Four. Yeah, that's well, the size. Probably right around eight acres. Cloudland Elementary School. Now, Cloudland is our newest school. It was built in 2001. It has uh, 12 acres and currently has 391 students. Now, I've got the conditions that this school is excellent. Now, we still have to do maintenance things and we have our daily stuff that we need to do, but as far as structurally and all the workings of it, uh, I consider it an excellent shape. And this school also has a knockout, which I use the word knockout for lack of a better one. For future expansion for 7th and 8th grade wing, I'll show you what I'm talking about right here in just, just a second. If you look at this school, right here on the second level, there's actually a hallway that's hidden inside this building. It was hidden. We actually knocked a hole in the wall and using it for storage at the moment. But for another wing to come out on this area right here, level with the second floor, which could probably possibly hold 10, 12 classrooms or something to that. Fact, they actually designed that into the school. And this school is geothermal. Uh, it's all, all the wells are, are located down in this area and down under the parking lot in this area down here. 391 students, did you say? 391, yes. And the capacity is? I don't know yet. I can get that off the print. Yeah. And I'll tell you something else <laughs> on the, the capacity, you know, being in schools. You know, if, if you calculate that just by square footage, I think that's very deceiving. Yes, because we all know that that's not usable, all of its usable yeah. classroom space. So well, that's I, a hard I, thing to put your, yeah. put your hand put the your hand on. The capacity is a guess at best, mm -hmm. but it's an educated guess. And that's what I'm looking for, about what you think it would hold. Because okay. that say we want, did, did you want to expand that. Do the, go out that way and build on what you really need, and then you would have to worry about it. Yeah, I think I've got two twisted up here. This is actually Cloudland High School here. Mm -hmm. This this school was built in the late 50s, early 60s. It's had several additions onto it. As you can see, it's pretty much property lines with this road. Mm -hmm. Here's the property line, so we're pretty much got to cover. Of course, here's the football field, and the property line is right behind that. Mm -hmm. We actually got some property across a county road that the students are parking on the other side of the road uh, for space. So. This way. Building 59, I got backwards on my slides here. But it had an addition in 77, 2002, and 2007. And actually, this building is in good condition also. It has 11 acres, but like I showed you, we're pretty much covered on the, as far as any expansion or anything on that one. Currently has 325 students. And its biggest need is its parking. Uh, the parking area resurfacing and fencing. Now, some of these, when I say fencing, I don't mean the fences are falling down and the fence, you know, pretty, as far as that goes. But fencing for security. And we've tried to figure out, we've added some fencing in different places, you know, to kind of, when they get to school, we can close the gates. And, you know, we can feel like they're they're pretty safe as far as being inside where some, you know, not forbid somebody trying to come in and do something in that respect. And actually, Cloudland High School is 12 miles from Hampton High School. Has there ever been any thought to, I'm just going to say, closing down a portion of that street? You know, where you, you has access from either end, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Especially in between that parking area, maybe maybe you close one end of it to where you don't have a traffic flow issue between. Them. Yeah, well, see this street. I mean, you can see this street here. Actually, it's a huge block here. Mm -hmm. There's actually houses and stuff up here. This side here is not used. It's not really a street. There's a house. There used to be a house right up here. It's not there anymore. So this this is not used. But there is a fence between that road and that right. part of the school. 
high schools are the hardest to try to do because you can see right here they're parking across the road. I mean, uh, you know, to get them in and out of there and get them all, you know, fenced in and get you, high schools are just a nightmare. They're That's spread out through the buildings, right? vocational departments and things like that. It's just hard to do. Elementaries are a little easier. Once you get them in the building, they're not going too far. I mean, they go class to class, they might go out and play, but they're not going to have to go to a vocational yeah. building or something like that. Yeah. And elementary was built in 1995. This, this building is also still in good condition. Uh, we're sitting on 12 acres. We currently have 706 students. And uh, we, we, we actually right now looking at replacing part of the roof. And you know, I had somebody ask me, you know, that school's not that old. But you think about it, that's what 18 years old or so. So everything wears out. We we got to get on a cycle where we, you know place something every year, the worst ones we've got, so you know we don't get there and then all of a sudden the big big project hits where we got six or eight schools that really need support. And it's thirteen miles from Little Milligan and three miles from Battle Four Gentleman. And that's not used to this one either. Here you can see the layout. Here it's a highway three twenty one here. And the school, school of course, parking in the rear and parking in the front both. And actually, this school has a all the plumbing and HVAC and things like that were run full size to this end of this building for a future addition on to this end if uh, need it or necessary. Hampton High School was built in 1963. It had a Vocational edition in 77 and the band room edition in 2001, and this building is also in good condition. It has 24.7 acres and currently 403 students. And the, the initial needs there are, of course, again, modular classrooms. We need some additions to eliminate that, fencing, and toilet and dressing area renovations, which, you know, we could probably say that is about every one of them. But, uh, that's the three, the worst needs that I feel at that school there. And the layout of that school. And there's the football and the, this is the baseball field and stuff. Actually, I think Mr. Shooter referred to the McLean's place is back up this way. And so we actually own a couple acres across the road here also. How much of that frontage on uh, 19? How, how far over? This road here? Yeah, yeah, all the way over the four lane. How much do, yes. do you own? Okay, just I believe if I'm not mistaken, probably lines from this road to the, to the right road here. And I assume you don't, the, the school system doesn't own this big. No. Yes. No. no. Not to my knowledge. <coughs> no. That's private here, but we they own the across from the high school, that little streak of land right there. Yeah, that little strip right uh, there. Right there, yeah. That's, the, that's where they want to build the park. Yeah, that's where they're talking about building that little that's park the right. right there. That Valley Elementary was built in 1948. And it's hard to pin down any definite dates on some additions. Uh, I had 60s, 70s, 80s, and 2001. And actually, this school's in good condition also for its age. And sits on 13 acres and 579 students currently in row. Needs at that school again is to, uh, in addition to eliminate some portable classrooms, I think they have seven at that school. Window renovations, uh, roof replacement on one section, and I think it's the only section. This section here is actually the only section we've had to re roofed in the past few years. See the rest of it. Here's Austin, here's our little trailer park. Yeah. Who's Four. property values on that thing? Actually, it's, it's right on this side of this road here, and it comes back, it comes along along with. Well, actually, it's plugged in right here. As long as it goes back to so this, Clark. Is, this is ball field, so it would go back to about here. Okay. So you have all this area here. You know, it's uh, open right at the moment. And it's on sewer now. It's on the city sewer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Happy Valley High School built in 1962. Had a addition in '77 and '88 in good condition and it's on 27.5 acres at 484 students currently enrolled. 
and I have toilet filtration area renovation. We've recently put a rip on this and some windows.